Live from Midtown Manhattan, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data New York City 2017. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem sponsors. Okay, welcome back everyone. Live here in New York, this is theCUBE's coverage, Big Data NYC, our event. We've been doing it for five years. This is our event in conjunction with Strata Data, which is the O'Reilly Media event. We run a separate event, but we've been covering the Big Data for eight years since 2010. Hadoop World, this is theCUBE. Of course, theCUBE is never going to change. They might call it Strata AI next year, or whatever trend that they might see. So, but we're going to keep it theCUBE. This is in New York City, our eighth year of coverage. Guys, welcome to theCUBE. Our next two guests is Andrew Burt, Chief Privacy Officer, and Andrew Gilman, Chief Customer Officer and CMO. You guys are startups, so you got all these fancy titles, but you're in the, on the A-team from Immuta, hot startup. Welcome to theCUBE. Great Thanks to see for having you again. us, Thank appreciate you. it. Okay, so the, you guys are the startup feature here this week on theCUBE, our, our little segment here. I think you guys are the hottest startup that uh, is out there and that people aren't really talking a lot about. So you guys are brand new. You guys are kind of really good reputation, get a lot of props on inside the community, especially in the people who know data, data science, and know some of the intelligence organizations. But respectful people like Dan Hutchins just says you guys are, are rock stars and doing great. So why all the buzz inside the community? Now you guys are just starting to go yeah. to the market? What's the update yeah, of the company? Yeah, so, so great story. Um, uh, founded in 2014 uh, with their Series A investment. It was announced earlier this year. And you know the team, you know, group of serial entrepreneurs uh, sold their last uh, company to CSC, uh, ran the uh, private, the, the uh, public sector business for them for a while, and uh, you know, really special group of uh, engineers and technologists mm -hmm. and data scientists, um, headquartered out of DC, customer success organization out of uh, Columbus, Ohio, and we're servicing you know, Fortune 100 companies. So Immuta, um, I M M U T A. Immuta.com. We just launched a new website uh, earlier this week in in preparation for the show, and the easiest way to so think Immuta, Immutable. Yeah, immutable. Uh, I'm region. sure there's a backstory. Immutable. Yeah, we we do not ever touch the raw data. So we we're all about managing risk and managing the integrity of the data. And so risk and integrity and security are baked into everything we do. And so we want our customers to know that their data will be immutable. Um, and that in using us, they'll never pose an additional risk. I think of blockchain, when I think about immutability, I'm like, I'm so into blockchain <laughs> these days, but as you guys know, I'm mean, totally into it. There's but no let's blockchain get, in our technology. I, I, I know, but let's get down to the, why the motivation to enter the market. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of noisy stuff out there. Why do we yeah. need another unified platform? Yeah, so I mean, the, the big opportunity that we saw was, you know, organizations had spent basically the past decade refining and upgrading their application infrastructure. Right, and doing so under the guise of digital transformation, right? So we've, we've really built out organizations, people, processes to support monolithic applications. Now those applications mm -hmm. are moving to the cloud, they're being re-architected in a microservices mm -hmm. architecture. So we have all this data now. Um, how do we manage it for the new application, which we see is really algorithm-centric, right? The Amazons of the world have proven, how do you compete against anyone? How do you disrupt any industry? that operationalize your data in a new way. Well, they were developer-centric, right? They were very focused on the developer. Yep. You guys are saying you're algorithm-centric, meaning yes. the software within the software kind of thing. It's really about, we see the future enterprise to compete. You have to build thousands of algorithms. And each one of those algorithms is going to do something very specific, very precise, but faster than any human can do. And mm -hmm. so how do you enable an application, a, excuse me, an algorithm-centric infrastructure to support that? And today, you know, as we go and meet with our customers and, and uh, other groups, the people, the processes, the data is everywhere. The governance folks who have to control how the data is used, the laws are dynamic, the tooling is complex, right? So this whole world looks very much like pre-DevOps IT or pre-cloud IT. It takes on average between four to six months to get a data scientist up and running on a project. So here's, let's get into the company. I want to just get that just out and put some context code. I see the problem you solve, a lot of algorithms out there. More and more open source is coming onto the scene where the Linux Foundation have their new event, rebrand Open Source Summit, shows exponential growth in open source. Yeah. So no doubt about it, software's going to be, no, new guys are coming on, new gals, tons of software. What is the company yep. positioning? Yep. Absolutely. What do you guys yep. do? So How many employees? Let's yep. go down by the numbers and then what, and talk about the problem that you solve. Okay, cool. So company, we have, we'll be about 40 people by Q1. Uh, heavy engineering, go to market, 
Uh, we're operating uh, and working with, Fortune, as I mentioned, Fortune 100 clients, highly regulated industries, financial services, healthcare, uh, government, uh, insurance, et cetera, right? So where you have lots of data that you need to operationalize that's very sensitive to use. Um, what else? Uh, company positioning. So we are positioned as data management for data science. So the opportunity that we saw, again, managing data for applications is very different than managing data for algorithm development. So you're selling to the, data to the CDO, Chief Data Officer, you're selling to the analytics? Who's yeah, so in, our, in a lot of our customers, like in financial services, we're going right into the line of business, right? We're working with managing directors who are building out next generation analytics infrastructure that need to unify and connect the data in a new way that's dynamic, right? It's not just the data mm -hmm. that they have within their organization, they're looking to bring data in from outside. Um, they want to also work collaboratively with governance professionals and lawyers who, you know, in financial services, they are, you know, we, we always jest in the company that different organizations have these cool new tools, like data scientists have all their new tools and everyone's, and the data, um, you know, the data owners have, you know, flash disks and they have all this, but the governance people still have Microsoft Word. And maybe the mm -hmm. newer tools are like Wiki, so now we can get it off a of Word and make it shareable. Yeah. But what we allow them to do is, that, and, and what Andrew Bird has really driven, is the ability for you to take internal logic, right, internal policies, external regulations, and put them into code that becomes dynamically enforceable as you're querying the data, as you're using it to train algorithms and to drive um, you know, uh, mathematical decision making in the enterprise. Andrew, let's yeah. jump into some of the privacy. Yeah. You're the chief privacy officer, which is code words for, you're doing all the, go the governance stuff, and there's a lot of stuff business-wise that's going on around GDPR, which is actually relevant. Right. And there's a lot of dollars on the table for that too, so it's probably good for business, but there's a lot of policy stuff going on. How do you, what's going on with you guys in this area? So I think policy is really catching up to just the world of big data. We've known for a very long time that data is incredibly important. It's the lifeblood of an increasingly large number of organizations. Um, and because data is becoming more important, laws are starting to catch up. And I think GDPR is really, you know, it's hot to talk about. I think it's just the beginning of a larger people trend. People are scared. Yeah. I mean, people are nervous. It's like they don't know, this could be a blank check that they're signing away. Well, so the enforcement side is, in, Pretty yeah. outrageous. So I mean, the the, the so is that right? I mean, people are scared, or what do you think? Yeah, people are. I think people are terrified because they know that it's important, and they're also terrified because data scientists um, and folks in IT have never really had to think very seriously about implementing complex laws. I think GDPR is the first example of laws um, uh, forcing technology to uh, basically blend software and law. The only way, I mean, one of our theses is the only way to actually solve for GDPR is to embed laws within the software you're using. And so we're moving away from this meetings and memos type uh, approach to governing data, which is very slow, it can take months, and we need it to happen dynamically. Yeah, this uh, is why I wanted to bring you guys in. Not only, I, Andrew, we knew each other from another venture, but what got my attention for you guys was really this, this intersection between law and society and tech. Yeah. And this is just the beginning. I mean, you look at the, the, the tell signs there. Peter Burris, who runs research for Wikibon, um, coined the term programming real, the real world. Life, yeah. basically. Yeah. You got yeah. wearables, you got IoT. This is happening, self-driving car. Who decides what side of the street people walk on now? I mean, yeah. right. law and code yeah. are coming together. Yeah. That's algorithms, there'll be more of them. Yep. Is yeah. there an algorithm for the algorithms? Who teaches the data set? Who, share, who yeah. shares the data yeah. set? Wait a minute, I don't want to share my data set because I have a law that says I can't. Yeah. Yeah. Who decides all this yeah. stuff? So that's exactly, I mean, that's what we, we are starting to enter a world where governments really, really care about that stuff. Um, just in, in but Silicon in the Valley, that which is not in their DNA, and you're exactly. seeing it all over the front pages of the news. Right. They can't even get yeah. it right in inclusion and diversity. How can they like right. work with laws? Tension, tension is brewing. Um, yeah. And uh, in in the U.S., our regulatory environment is a little more lax. We want to see innovation happen first and then regulate. But G, uh, the EU is completely different. There are laws in China and Russia and elsewhere around the world, and it's basically becoming impossible to be a global organization and still take that approach where you you yeah. can afford to be scared of that. I don't know how I feel about this because I get like all kinds of like you know rushes of intoxication to fear. I mean look <laughs> at what's going on with Bitcoin and blockchain. The uh, underbelly is a whole new counterculture going on around Im uh, in immutable data yep. but you know anonymous yep. cultures where yeah. there's a complete anonymous underbelly yeah. going on. I just on. think the risk factors going up when you you mentioned IoT so it's where you are and you know your devices and your home 
Now think about 23andMe, Verily, Freenome, where you're digitizing your DNA, right? We're, we already started to do that with MRIs and, and other yeah. you know, uh, operations that we've had. But if you think about now, you know, I'm handing over my DNA to an organization because I want to find out my lineage. I want to learn about where I came from. You know, how do I make sure that the derived data off of that digital DNA is used properly, not just for me as Andrew, but for my progeny? Right? Yeah. And so that introduces some really interesting ethical issues, and it's, a, and it's an intersection of this new wave of investment, to your point, like in Silicon Valley, of bringing healthcare into, uh, into data science, into, uh, into um, you know, technology and the intersection, and, and the underlying, you know, the underpinning of the whole thing is the data, right? It's how do we manage the data and what do we and do? And AI that? really is the future here. And this, even though our machine learning is the key part of AI, we just wrote an article this morning on Silicon Angle from Gina Smith, our new writer. Google brain chief, AI tops humans in computer vision and healthcare will never be the same. Absolutely. And they're, they're talking about little things from like in 2011, you can barely do character recognition of pictures now, you yeah. can 100%. Yeah. Now you take that forward at the, um, at, in Heidelberg, Germany, the event this week we were covering, the Heidelberg Laureate Forum, or HLF 2017, yep. All the top scientists were there talking about the specific issue of this is society blending in with tech. Right. Absolutely. So there's just societal impact, legal impact, kind of blending. That's right. right. Algorithms are the only thing that's yeah. going to scale in this area. This yeah. is what you guys are trying to do, right? Exactly. I mean, that's the interesting thing. When you look at you know training models and algorithms and AI, right? AI yeah. is is the new buzz. You know, is the new cloud, right? I mm -hmm. walked. We're in New York. I'm walking down the street. And, and there's you know the algorithm era and everything is Ernst and Young you know billboards on algorithms I mean who would have thought right an AI <laughs> you know the cube is going to be an AI too yeah exactly hey we're AI yeah we're all brought to you by hey Siri do the cube interview yeah. but the you know. the interesting part of the whole AI and the algorithm is you know you have n number of models right we have we have lots of data scientists and AI experts <laughs> right and Siri, Siri goes off <laughs> sorry Siri to, yeah, didn't, mean to, didn't, yeah, <laughs> didn't mean to insult you Siri. But um, you know, it's all just you, you know, chance. it's applied math, right? By a different name, and you have n number of models. I mean, ninety percent of all algorithms are a single linear regression. What ultimately drives the outcome is going to be how you prepare and manage the data. And so, when we go back to the governance story, you know, governance in applications is very different than governance in data science because how we actually dynamically change the data is going to drive the outcome of that algorithm. Yeah. Right, directly. So if I'm you know, in a MUDA, right, we connect the data, we connect the data science tools, we allow you to control the data in a unique way. I refer to that as data personalization. So it's not just can I subscribe to the data, it's what does the data look like based on who I am and what those internal and external policies are. So think about this, for example. You know, I'm training a model that yeah. doesn't mask against race and doesn't generalize against age. What do you think is going to happen to that model when it goes start to interact? Either either it's delivered as well, a chatbot. Context is critical, and, and the the usability of data is because it's perishable at this point. Data that comes in quick is worth more, but historically the value goes down, but it's worth more when you train the machine. So two different issues. Exactly. Right? So, so it's really about longevity of the model. How can we create and train a model that's going to be able to stay in? It's like the new availability, right? Yeah. Can we, it's going to stay, it's going to be relevant, and it's not going to, it's going to keep us out of jail and keep us from getting sued as long as possible. Well, Jeff Dean, I just want to quote one more thing to get context. I want to ask uh, uh, Andrew over here about uh, his, his view on this. So, um, Jeff Dean, the Google brain chief behind all this stuff is saying, oh, AI en enabled healthcare. The sector is set to grow at an annual rate of 40% through 2021 when it's expected to hit 6.6 .6 billion spend yep. on AI-enabled healthcare, 6.6 .6 billion. Today it's around 600 million. Mm -hmm. That's the growth just in AI healthcare impact. Yep. Just healthcare. Yep. This is going to go from a policy privacy issue. One, healthcare data has been crippled with HIPAA, slowed us down, but the, where's the innovation going to come from? Where's the data? going to be in healthcare and other verticals. It's just as one vertical, financial services yep. is crazy too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I honestly, healthcare is one of the most interesting examples of uh, applied AI, and it's because there's no other realm, at least now, where people are thinking about AI and the risk is so apparent. Mm -hmm. If you get a diagnosis and the doctor doesn't understand why, it's very apparent, and if they're using a model that has no, you know, has a very low level of transparency, that ends up being really important. So I think healthcare is a really fascinating sector to think about. Um, but all of these issues, all of these different types of risk that have been around for a while, 
um, yeah. are, are starting to become more and more important as you know AI take, takes. All right, so know. I want to wrap up here, give you guys both a chance, and you can't copy each other's answer. Okay. So we'll start with you, Andrew, or over here. Okay. Explain Immuta in a simple way, someone who's not in the industry, what do you guys do, and then do a version for someone in the industry. So, so elevator pitch for you know, someone who's a friend who's not in the industry and someone who is. So uh, Immuta is a data management platform for data science, and what that actually gives you is we take the friction out of trying to access data, and trying to control data, and trying to comply with all mm -hmm. of the different rules that surround the use of that data. Great, now do the one for normal people. That was the normal, oh. okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear the leave. one for the insiders. Yeah. And then for the insiders. Just say it was magic. Uh, yeah, it, that's it's uh, magic. It's magic. Trust me, we're magic. Coming from the, you know, <laughs> or, you know, coming from the the infrastructure world, I, I like to refer to it as like a, a VMware for data science, right? We we create an abstraction layer that sits between the data and the data science tools, and we'll dynamically enforce policies based on the values of the organization, but also it drives better outcomes because today the data owners aren't confident that you know, you're going to do with the data what you say you're going to do. Yep. So they try to hold it, they're like the old server huggers, right, the, the data huggers. So we allow them to unlock that, make it universally ava available. We allow the governance people to get off those memos that have to be interpreted by IT and enforced and actually give them, allow them to write code and have it be enforced as they, as the policy mandates. And the number one problem you solve is what? Accelerate with confidence. We allow the data scientists to go and build models faster by connecting to the data in a way that they're confident that when they deploy their model, that it's going to go into production, it's going to stay into, produ in, into production. And what's the for GDPR angle? You got the legal brain over here in policy. What's going on with the GDPR? How are you guys going to be a solution for that? So uh, we have the most, uh, uh, I'd say, robust option of policy enforcement on data, uh, I think, available. And so we make it incredibly easy to comply with GDPR. We actually put together a sample memo that says here's what it looks like to comply with GDPR. It's written from a governance department sent to the you know, internal data science department. It's about a page and a half long. Um, mm -hmm. So it, we actually make that very onerous process. Um, uh, I wonder what the TAM is yeah. for GDPR. You guys know the size of that market? in terms of spend that's going to come around the corner. I mean, I think it's like the Y2K problem that's actually real. Exactly, it feels the same way, and actually Andrew and his team have taken apart the regulation, article by article, and have actually built in product features that satisfy yeah. that. So it's, it's an interesting I think it's really impressive that you guys bring a legal and a policy mind into the product discussion. I think, I think that's something that I think you guys are doing a little bit different than I see anyone out there. You're bringing legal and policy into the software fabric which is unique and I think is going to be the standard, in my opinion. Right. So, right. you know, hopefully this is a good trend and hopefully you guys uh, keep in touch. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for, Thanks for, for making Thank time you. to come over. So, uh, this is theCUBE, breaking out the startup action, sharing the hot startups here that really are a good position in the marketplace as the generation of the infrastructure changes. It's a whole new ball game, global development platform <laughs> called the internet, the new internet, it's decentralized. We even get the blockchain, we want to try that a little later, maybe another segment. It's theCUBE in New York City, more after this short break.